Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening or watching or whatever it is that you do when you're on YouTube. But as long as you're here, subscribe, would you? Uh, and, and for those uh, who are here, you already know this. But anyway, it's um, Marketplace APM. Thanks. Oh, my God. That Oh, not intentional. Not <laughs> intentional. Not intentional. Amazing. Yes, caught me with my Amazing. proverbial audio pants down, as it were. That was not supposed to be there because it's becoming a little bit of a trope, and I don't want to do this. Hey, everybody. I'm Kai Rizdahl. I'm Molly Wood. Please know it's completely spontaneous, apparently real, Jeez, every time. God. It's a tick. Oh, uh, This is, of course, Make Me Smart, the show where we get smart together because none of us, as we like to say, is as smart as all of us. This week, at long last, after so much begging on my part, we are going to talk about gene editing, specifically CRISPR, the gene editing tool that can alter DNA in plants and animals and even humans. You may occasionally hear it referred to as copy-paste for oh, gene editing. Interesting. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'll, in all honesty, I'm going to learn a ton on today's show. You will le learn less than I will, Ms. Wood, I'm sure, but uh, I will learn a ton. Uh, might have heard, like in the fall of last year, this Chinese scientist who reported that he had used CRISPR-edited genes uh, on human babies, pair of twins, girls, twin girls, uh, to make them resistant to HIV. Um, that is a big, big deal on ethical, moral, legal, and just general societal bounds. And, and so we're going to talk about mm -hmm. some of that uh, as well. Yeah, and the big reason, of course, is that their human trials of CRISPR have been progressing extremely slowly for lots of reasons, but also that and we'll get into this later, but that CRISPR gene editing can be inherited, like it can be passed oh, yeah. on to the offspring. It's a yeah. bit, it's a huge deal. And they think those twins might be smarter now. Anyway, right? CRISPR uh, is here, clearly. It is coming to market in some cases faster than anyone expected. It is turning into a scientific gold rush in a lot of ways. Uh, big pharma, agriculture, manufacturing, everybody is trying to get in the game. And as it happens, last week I was in Boston to moderate a panel about biotech investing and technology hmm. uh, with WGBH's Innovation Hub and their host, Kara Miller, was my co-host. And there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot going on in genetic medicine separate from just CRISPR, the yeah. gene editing part. There's yeah. also, use, you know, we really talked about how it's been almost exactly 20 years since the human genome was fully mapped and all of the things that have come out of that. And CRISPR is sort of like the, <laughs> like, peak, oh my God, when it comes to... <laughs> See, that's medicine. kind of where I am. All right. Anyway, so <laughs> we are going to do a whole bunch of CRISPR and gene editing stuff uh, on the podcast today with Megan Moltenny. She's from Wired, um, and she's going to walk us through a whole bunch of, of what will be very basic questions from me and very um, erudite and sophisticated questions from Ms. Wood. Um, first, oh, though, a little bit of—no, uh, well, it's true, right? Because you know this stuff, because you did the panel and everything. Um, a little bit of, of uh, on-the-ground perspective um, on CRISPR, and here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Our favorite kind of on the ground perspective, yes. in fact, from a listener. John Leonard is a scientist who works at a small biotech company in, here in the Bay Area, and he's focused on cell therapy. So putting a new gene into a cell to help that cell fight cancer. And his company is not yet using CRISPR, but they are thinking about it. Producer Sharon Morris called him up and he explained how that might work, how CRISPR might interact with cancerous cells. We would take, you know, blood from a patient, um, extract their immune cells from that, and then introduce a gene that encodes a receptor that allows the cells to, to track down cancer better um, and with the hope of then helping kind of boost their immune system to help it uh, kill a tumor. So there's, there's a bunch of things going on with CRISPR, as I understand it, from my, my very cursory reading for this interview that we're about to do. One of them is that it makes uh, gene altering, gene editing a lot faster, uh, but there's, there's a business case here as well. To be a company doing this, you have to get um, licensing rights to use this technology. Um, you know, there have been other approaches that, that people have used to introduce new genes into cells and give give them new functions. And CRISPR is just um, a way that is um, a lot more kind of flexible and a lot more kind of cheaper and easier to do. And the hope is that it's safer as well. Hmm, the, hope. the hope. Lovely. Lovely. That's great. <laughs> this is where we start the interview. I mean, it you know, it's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's a little view from the lab bench of a Make Me Smart listener. There's obviously a whole bunch more around the licensing and patents. That's probably a separate episode. But for now, let's take uh, our little step back and understand really what this technology means for business and tech. And we have Megan Multeni on the line, a staff writer at Wired who covers the intersection, our favorite word in the tech industry of science, health and tech. <laughs> her Twitter bio says you should totally send her your CRISPR Hot takes. 
Welcome to the show, Megan. Hi, good morning. <gasps> Crisper hot take, peak, oh my God. Yeah, discuss. <laughs> discuss. Not that hot, not that hot. <laughs> not that hot, not that hot. Um, so you heard John just talk about some of the pros, you know, potentially of CRISPR when it comes to really curing and tackling genetic diseases. Let's like let's start with the positive. You know, what are what are some of the other sort of potential outcomes of this technology? Well, gosh, I think if you can imagine an outcome, uh, you can almost chart a path there with CRISPR is kind of uh, oh. what we're what we're talking about. So, you know, that yeah, I think, you know, the medical aspect, like, can you reprogram cells to do things that they were never able to do naturally in your body? So attack a cancer cell better or, you know, for someone who has a genetic mutation that maybe causes them to have sickle cell disease, can you fix that gene so that they no longer make uh, kind of, you know, these twisted, bent red blood cells and and they can be fine. So there, there's a whole bunch of medical applications, but it really is much bigger than that. You know, anything, because this works it not just in humans, it works, you know, so far scientists have tried it in every organism from like corn to cuttlefish and like it works. So hmm. you can imagine crops that are resistant to all of our extreme weather events. You can imagine foods that are more nutritious than kind of the way nature, uh, evol you know, they evolved in nature. You can imagine uh, there, I mean, there are factories around the country and around the world right now filled with yeast and bacteria that are uh, being programmed to make materials that have never existed in the world before, and that's all using CRISPR. Hmm. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, seriously, because there's yeah, yes yeah. and yay to all of this. And if we can get rid of cancer through this, that's fine. And if and if cuttlefish can be made to taste better, that's or whatever that's for, fine. But... It, it does seem to me that there's a little bit of a can versus should thing going on here, right? Well, sure. I mean, like any technology that is sufficiently powerful, you know, we may have the ability to wield it to, with, to whatever we can imagine. Whether we have the knowledge to decide whether that's a good idea mm -hmm. is, um, you know, obviously still up in the air. And I think with CRISPR, with the example that, that you mentioned, kind of the one that most people are familiar with, with the twin girls in China, like we're talking about, you know, putting the evolution of the human species kind of in our own hands. Those are the, those are the stakes. Mm -hmm. Oh man, mm -hmm. you're not making it any yeah. better. You're, you're, you're I'm, up to you. <laughs> I'm trying, like I'm trying so hard not to jump straight ahead to speciation. So I'm gonna just like back oh up God. for well, a second. First, you're gonna have to define that. But anyway, <laughs> um, are we also? Let's try to get like a real, like a table setting here, because there's all the things we can imagine, and there's all the things that seem like they should be possible, and things that have already worked. But where are we on? You know, there's can versus should, but there's also could versus can like where are we in terms of things we can actually do right now sure so i mean in terms of it kind of you know we might want to go kind of sector by sector if we're talking you know agriculture which is kind of the field where most experts think people are going to see advances in this kind of uh, intersecting with their own lives the most um, we're our, we've already seen the first gene edited crop show up. Um, it actually uses an older technology, not CRISPR. We don't have to get into the specifics. There are plenty of CRISPR food companies, you know, with, uh, field trials in the works. So more is coming. Um, but you know, we're, we're already have at least one food product in the food chain that is made using a gene editing technology. And because the USDA decided that they weren't going to regulate it, uh, as a genetically modified organism, if the change that you were making was one that theoretically could have happened in nature and you just kind of super sped it up with CRISPR, um, we're going to see a, it's going to flourish mm. and it's going to happen like pretty quickly. So mm. how, I, um, I'm trying to formulate this question the right way. It, how much of um, the, the what could possibly go wrong camp, which I am representing here uh, to an excess, right, just to make a point, how much of that is because people don't actually understand either the technology or the safeguards that are being taken on the assumption that safeguards are being taken? I think there's probably a little bit of both, right? I mean, you know, the the one that people want to jump to the fastest is this idea of designer babies and, you know, having a menu of changes you could make to an embryo uh, at an IVF clinic and, you know, choose how your, how your future offspring is going to look, how tall they're going to be, you know, whether or not they have immunity to HIV, kind of, et cetera. But all of that is kind of built upon the the idea that we know how genes work. And right now, kind of that 
knowledge is is very much in its infancy. So, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, obviously there are people who are willing to go outside of the bounds of legal yeah. and ethical lines and and push that forward. And I think that, you know, is is uh, has thrown a, a real cold shower on the people who said this was going to move forward responsibly. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of what's actually possible, there isn't there are there there are not yet there's not a gene for height there's not a gene for intelligence hmm. like these things do not have a one to one correlation and they're not going to be showing up mm-hmm. I, I mean anytime soon if maybe ever hmm. mm-hmm. so so that's that's kind of on, that's on the on the on the knowledge side yeah. you know on 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 how these things work i mean in terms of what's possible i think there are people are right to be concerned. Like this is a a powerful technology. We're talking about, you know, it's great if it's in the hands of a cancer researcher who's making a cure, but what, but CRISPR is, you know, fast and easy enough and cheap enough to get that, you know, one of the the U.S. government is concerned about it as a potential bioweapon. And that's, you know, that's, it was in 2016, James Clapper put it on the list of, um, uh, like his 2016, yeah. yeah, his national safety threat report basically said it mm-hmm. is a weapon of mass destruction. So, sorry, can can I just ask a clarifying question here? When you say it's fast and cheap and easy, what does that mean? Is that like a, a graduate student in molecular biology could do this? Do a really sophisticated high school senior? Do you need a whole PhD lab? What do you need a corporate you know structure behind you? Well, you definitely don't need definitely don't need a PhD lab, um, or you know you don't have, need a PhD to do this. Huh. Um, there are companies that are making this. You know you can now go online. You can order uh, CRISPR components, CRISPR cells. You just say, hey, I want to target this gene. I want to knock it out, or I want to do whatever. And if you can have an address that goes to an academic institution or a biotech company, they'll just send it to you. Um, and obviously, hmm. I've spoken to people kind of in the biohacking community, and there's lots of workarounds to this. So you know there are. I would not say that the system is is currently fail safe to keep yeah. this only in the hands of of people who should you know who follow kind of norms and scientific ethical right, guidelines. Right. right. Mm-hmm. What does it look like when when you say it's a potential agent of biological warfare? Is that because you can create sort of super specifically targeted diseases like a like a flu that would attack a specific uh, set of people based on their genetic makeup? Sure. I mean, the ones that I've seen people kind of tout out kind of in, in the most, um, you know, kind of most often are more like recreating, you know, extinct forms of smallpox or, you know, other other kind of diseases that humans no longer have um, immunity to that, you know, you kind of stitch together fragments using some mail order DNA. There was actually a research team at the University of Alberta a couple years ago that did this in about six months for about $100,000. Um, you know, so these are the kinds of things that uh, the U.S. government is worried about. DARPA actually launched an initiative um, to called Safe Genes to kind of help companies that make these CRISPR hmm. constructs and synthetic biology constructs have like a, a monitoring tool kind of a that would pick up any of these, you know, potentially dangerous um DNA sequences that correlate to, you know, things that could be an infectious disease that could be released on a population and kind of put a halt on on that order. Um, that's one of the things that people are doing right now as a possible countermeasure. So on the theory that this is coming on a larger scale, because it is, what's the regulatory framework? I mean, is there anybody in charge? Is, is gene editing uh, legal, illegal? I mean, what's the what's the current state of play? Sure. So for, as I said, with in the agricultural sector, USDA has basically said, if this could happen in nature and you're just speeding it up, you you know, full steam right. ahead, green light. Um, if we're talking about human therapeutics, we should, without getting too in the weeds, yeah. make a distinction between what we call germline editing and somatic cell editing. So oh the example you gave about the researcher in China, uh, he made an edit to embryos. That's called germline editing. What's where the edit is made um, kind of at the embryo level and that that change is inherited in theoretically every cell that person passes. So that means that that change could be passed down to their children. Um, mm-hmm. Right now in the U.S., there is essentially a moratorium on any Basically, the the FDA Congress has told the FDA you cannot consider you cannot consider any applications for any clinical trials that uses an embryo that's been modified. So, hmm. no one's going to be that's you basically okay. can't do that here in the U.S. Okay. Um, 
But like the example that your caller gave about, you know, taking cells out of someone's body, making some edits, putting them back in, those cells are not going to turn, you know, those are not sperm or egg making cells. They're just going in and they're basically a, an infusion of, it's a treatment. Um, and those, those therapies are, are moving ahead. The uh, FDA has oversight over clinical trials. The first one in the U.S. actually just started um, earlier this month. So that's at the University of Pennsylvania. It's a cancer fighting uh cell therapy. And there's more in the works, um, kind of fighting sickle cell and some other blood dis uh, disorders that are moving ahead in Europe. Hmm. So in the U.S., those those kind of they um, they kind of fall under the like a gene therapy, cell therapy um, track. And the FDA has oversight over that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then one other issue, of course, in the wake of Theranos is investment. Like this is mm -hmm. such a, mm -hmm. you know, healthcare is such a huge part of the economy and there's so much potential money here that all kinds of people are rushing to get into this game. And by people, I mean venture capitalists who don't necessarily know what they're getting into. And there are some who are doing due diligence and asking for peer reviewed science. But as we saw with Theranos, there are plenty who are fine with a PowerPoint and a dream. And I wonder, you know, what is that going to look like and mm -hmm. how dangerous could that scenario get? Well, you know, Theranos was able to – Theranos was in a position where they were basically saying we don't need to be regulated by the FDA um, because, again, without getting into kind of CLIA lab certification uh, regulations, basically they, they were able to operate outside the FDA framework. Um, these kinds of therapies, like there's, there's really no workaround. Um, so – in order for any of these companies who are playing kind of in the in the therapeutic biopharma space um, to move forward, they have to show preclinical data in cells and animals, and they've got to go through the whole you know phase one, two, three. Um, there's not a lot of you know there's not a lot of room there for people to kind of spoof uh, you know good good CRISPR mm. results per se. So I would say um, I think people are probably overpromising what they can do. Uh, with CRISPR, what I've seen the most of right now is people saying that it is exactly this, like a cut and paste. And I think it's important for people to know that right now, <laughs> CRISPR, at least kind of in the classic sense, and we can talk about what other kind of <laughs> CRISPR universes are out there, um, is much better at, at, at making a cut and, and, and like crippling a gene than putting in a new and better one. It's like not very good at that yet. So anyone who's saying that like they're out there kind of cutting and pasting genes are probably overselling what CRISPR can do. On that idea, wanted. yeah, on that idea of other CRISPR universes, uh, are, are you optimistic or pessimistic that we are going to, writ large, get this right? I mean, I'm an optimist. I think, you know, uh, I think part of our <laughs> part of our outlook at, at Wired is trying to, to find an optimistic uh, future in yeah. all of this, you know, kind of technology yeah. avalanche. So coming from that place, I mean, I think what what maybe is um, maybe what maybe people don't realize is that CRISPR kind of no longer means just one thing. It's kind of this hmm. umbrella term over a whole bunch of different molecular tools. And, and you know, the way I think a metaphor that's really useful is to think that all CRISPR systems basically consist of two parts. It's a genetic GPS system that is programmable, and then it's attached to some kind of molecular tool. So essentially what that allows you to do is type in the coordinates for any place in a genome and send your tool to that place. And like, that is the revolutionary part. And the what the actual tools do, do once they get there is kind of the moment that we're in right now. There's mm. actually this real gold rush on and kind of a patent rush right. on all of these different enzymes, either out in nature or evolving them in labs or tinkering with them to kind of do different things. And that's kind of where we are. And I think that's what's actually mm. most exciting in this space right now. Which is a cool way to leave it. Megan Multeni, she's at mm. Wired uh, Science, Health and Technology. I understand better now. So that's good. That's good. That's a plus. It I worked. Got it Thanks, worked. Megan. <laughs> it worked. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Megan. Take it easy. There, there you go. So now I know more, and that's the way this whole show is supposed to work. It's working. I know. Tell us if it worked for you, uh, or if you have a utopian or a dystopian scenario, yeah. or more questions. Uh, send us a voice memo. We yeah. love them. Make me smart at marketplace.org. We will be back. I think we ought to let Molly bring us back every now and then. I just say, yeah, but I don't get the timing time. wrong. Well, you know what? 
Step up, pal. Come on. We can fix it, right, though? Yeah. Right. Well, I, we I can't can step up on the lag. What? I don't know what the lag is. Well, we should tell people what the lag is. I'll Molly's in Oakland. with my, like, atomic clock. <laughs> well, we, that's right. So Molly's in Oakland. We're in L.A., and there's it. speed of light notwithstanding. It takes time for the signal to get from here to there. So there's a little lag. So she can't come right in on the bomb. But anyway, that's what exactly. that is. That's uh, why. That's in why. case you've, I'm not feeling yes. slighted, everyone. We're yes. cool. So we're going to talk <laughs> substantive, and then we're going to talk Avengers, right, real quick? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. All right. You want to go first? Yeah. Uh, sure. Pick one, by the way. Pick one. Pick one. You've there, it's two, two links to the same story. Don't panic. <laughs> this one time, I just picked one thing, plus Avengers <laughs> but I, bonus. But I had to do a two link thing. Well, because one is like I, a fight. One is a paywall. You. you know, I'm just trying to be nice. Mm. Um, for the first time, and this is a pretty big deal. Facebook is opening up its data. It's giving researchers, actual academics, speaking of you know peer reviewed research, mm -hmm. the ability to look at information across the entire platform in order to help determine how it influences elections. Do you now, believe that this is genuine? <laughs> Sorry, just had to go right there. Uh-huh, exactly. Okay. So that is a super big deal. Yeah. They did this with one group. They gave a grant to one research organization, two, sorry, uh, 60 researchers from 30 institutions across 11 countries selected by two partner organizations. So with a you know, filter that Facebook works directly with. And the information that they can study only goes back to 2017. Well, come on, it man. Not, it come does, on. It does not include. Come on. It does not include the time frame <laughs> of the 2016 oh. election in the United States, which I think we can all agree was sort of kind of a little bit the Hiroshima little bit. Little bit. of election manipulation on social networks. But oh, OK. Oh. All right. So so they're not serious. That's that's what I hear, right? They're not serious. I mean, I am amazed to discover, and this is why I put in two links and tried to read like 17 more. I I I have not seen anyone saying that they don't appear to be serious. Like, but it, that's how it feels to me. It looks like they're not serious. That's just, you know, layman's understanding of what's going on here. You can look at it everything doesn't but feel oh, no, very not serious. 2017. Uh, yep. you know. Like if they had if they had put, you know, I don't know. 50 engineers toward creating a scrubbed database of information that they right. opened up, made it, you know, made it like an open source database yeah, that so any serious. researcher anywhere could dig into. And it went back to like 2010 yep. or even 2005 so that you could get yep. this. Yes. Would that be a large undertaking? Yeah. Do a lot of people work at Facebook? That's my understanding. <laughs> like, come on. Uh, that's my understanding. Right. So, so yes. Okay. So doesn't feel very serious. There you go. There you go. That's but your it's Facebook a start, I guess. Day. I don't it's know. I'm trying to be positive. It's baby steps, baby. Baby steps. Uh, okay. So mine is, and I don't really, 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 really don't want to get down into the minutia of monetary policy and inflation and what the Federal Reserve is going to do. But there is a piece in the New York Times in the upshot section by a friend of the pod, as it were, uh, Neil Irwin, writing about Love the Federal guy. Reserve and um, how it finds itself in a little bit of a jam in terms of how to keep this economy going. Because what we have is a growing economy, at least right now, with inflation nowhere to be found. And what that is doing is putting the Fed between a rock and a hard place in terms of how it's going to be able to handle the next recession. Because interest rates right now are still incredibly low. One of the ways you would fight a recession would be to lower interest rates to make money even cheaper. And money is incredibly cheap in this economy, as we have said on Marketplace a zillion times. I encourage you to read this piece. It's a little, it's a little weedy. It's a little dense. Um, but it's a great piece on, on the problem that the Federal Reserve finds itself in because inflation in this economy is still basically... And there will be people who will write in and say gas is $5 or $4, Kai. How can you say that? But inflation is basically non-existent in this economy at a core level. Um, anyway, read it. And we'll have a link um, uh, on our webpage because it's it's really good. And, and Neil explains things really well. And that's it. That's all I'll say. Neil's great. Yeah, that's so interesting. And everything about this is so interesting because it feels like Neil is also, of course, you may remember, we call him a friend of the pod because he's the guy we had on when he said, oh, geez, I was, you know, at this big event in Aspen and all these monetary policy people who are supposed to run the world yeah. in terms of how money works and economies work are basically like, huh, we're yeah. not totally sure that we have all the same tools we used to because right. like Amazon and Facebook and, yeah. and then now this. And I mean, it feels like we're at a moment when we're weirdly sort of rewriting mm -hmm. the rules mm -hmm. of economies and, and then not to mix my subject areas 
But you get the politicization of the Federal Reserve in the person of yeah. Herman Cain and Stephen Moore and, and Donald Trump and Larry Kudlow. Uh, and it becomes even more uh, curiouser and curiouser. So, so anyway, read this piece by Neil Irwin. Call it, a, call it a, a, a small addition to your monetary policy knowledge bank. How about that? Homework. Okay, yeah. Uh, all right, Avengers, super quickly, and no spoilers? No spoilers. All right. We had to have a little argument about we, this because Kai we thinks little, we should be able to, but I just can't. We had a little pre, pre-roll uh, discussion about spoilers, and I caved <laughs> because Molly's right. Um, here, here's the thing with Avengers, uh, Endgame specifically. First of all, uh-huh. Yay, three hours, but come on. Couldn't do it in like two hours and 20 minutes, so I didn't have to have all those people walking back in front of me going to the bathroom. Item number one. Item number two, honestly, I think somehow it should have come with some kind of user guide online just to remind us who all those gosh darn superheroes are. Because if if you you are an occasional follower of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which I am, I have not seen all 22 films that have come out in the last 10 years, you're a little confused when these people start popping up on the screen. So that's, that's what I'm I was saying. wondering, actually. Yeah. Because yeah. for me, uh, having spent so many hours of yeah. my life yeah. on the previous 21 movies mm-hmm. and then all three hours on this one. Wait, hang on. Um, Did you see really all 21? I've seen all 21. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and all in right. fact, I have probably watched the last 45 minutes of the original Avengers movie like 150 times. Wow. Because it's always on FX. And as you know, my favorite movie or my literally my favorite show in life is whatever crappy movie is on FX because I'm tired <laughs> and I don't want to work very hard at my TV. And a lot of times that's Avengers. And I always come in just in time for the original Battle of New York fight scene, which is instrumental. Oh, my God. That's to so the funny. entire canon. So many like I haven't memorized. Right. Um, so for me, this movie is a love letter. Yes. Yeah, I mean, see, it is so like funny. a giant... I was sitting. Thank next you. To two and there's of those like people. recreations. Yeah. Of this. yeah yep. I mean, and they're like, ooh, Jarvis. So, that's Jarvis. And I'm like, what? Who? What? Like, what did you remember? Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Careful, careful. Oh my God, sorry. I'm really sorry. Know, We're gonna a... leave that in just to show that I kind of blew it. <laughs> Are but, we? But but if Are that's the, but if that's the spoiler, then come on. Come oh my on. God, can that we was bleep nothing. It? Because that was that would nothing. be hysterical. That was nothing. If we bleep it, that would be really really funny though. I'm just saying for comedy reasons, I think we should. Um Fine. So, but I, but I came out wondering that same thing and I would be curious to know everyone's thoughts. And also I feel like just for the way I took a selfie of myself in the bathroom, like ugly what? cry, hot mess what? after the movie to send to a friend. And I almost want to like put it on the web well, because now you have it was to. so, you understand now you're like that's obliged to put that actual up. audible sobs escaped my body oh my more than one time really? during the course. All right. Of so look, movie. I got it. Oh, yeah. I got a teeny but bit. I well, no, I'm not saying can't anything. Imagine. Never mind. Never mind. No, you're you're, not. You, now you're going into, cr- all right, we should move on. No, 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 because it's the end, right? So every, so no matter what, it was going to be extremely hard. I, I suggest you not for some proceed. Of us. I'm just saying. But I do wonder if it has the same emotional impact for the more casual viewer, and I'm really curious about that. I know at least one marketplace person right. who has not can, seen any other Avengers movies. Can we talk about this like next Avengers week then? Movies. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Because well, it's like sold little, out. You, you it's really hard to get tickets. You do a little soul searching and see if in, you know, 160 hours or whatever a week is, we can talk about soul this again. Soul stone right? searching? No. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> yes, you are. We move? There we go. Hi, Kai and Molly. Saved this by the Brent producer. You guys this is went Rebecca a little long. From it was great to hear comments oh, on my question so about oh my GDPR. God. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. All right. Uh, in Peak two sentences, nerd. here we go. We talked about Medicare for All last week. It was actually a really good discussion with Sarah Cliff from Vox. Uh, lots of comments. Here's uh, William Jimenez. Go. I'm wondering if these proposals also have implications for how we compensate medical professionals. It seems to me that the medical profession in other single-payer countries isn't as lucrative as in the U.S., which would presumably lower health care costs. Is my understanding correct? And if so, are there any downsides to this change, such as lost talent to better paying fields? My guess would be yes, because the money's got to come from somewhere. But let us steer you to our friends at uh, Politico uh, at the agenda, where they do a bunch Mm -hmm. of healthcare and and policy stuff. And they've got a good explainer on this, and we'll put it up. Uh, But that's a really good question, right? Because the money is going to have to come from somewhere. It's going to cost a gazillion dollars. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. And and it does point out that in other countries, roughly two thirds of doctors are general practitioners as opposed to here, where roughly two thirds are specialists. But that also, you know, has its downsides, such as it takes a year to get to a dermatologist and all they want to do is surgery. I might be speaking from recent personal experience. 
Listener Karen <laughs> Tibbles. The dermatologist thing is a freaking scam, man. Oh. Uh-huh. Listener Karen Tibbles is uh, also going to help us answer William's question with less of a personal tangent. She went to an event last year put on by Kaiser Family Foundation and the Peterson Center on Healthcare, and she said she was struck by two charts. One showed that the cost per person of U.S. health care paid for by the government, Medicare and Medicaid programs, is very similar to what governments of other countries spend. But another slide that I saw illustrated the problem. In the U.S., the expenses on salaries are much higher than the other countries. That's the difference. Yeah, it is. And that's the thing that we talked about with Sarah, wow. about bending the cost curve, right? That's the whole reason, well, not the whole reason, but that's a big part of what Obamacare was trying to do. Uh, and it's a question in Medicare for All and whether that's going to actually change how much, literally just how much we're spending on x-rays or, you know, phlebotomy bags or what, I don't even know, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yep, yep, yep. So uh, <laughs> we've got one now, for uh, uh, a voice memo from Jamie Pahotsky. Uh, he's an American living in the U.K., uh, and he told us um, a little bit about what's at stake when we're trying to fix our healthcare system. So I have HIV. I'm completely healthy, provided I take these three pills that came out 20 years ago. Um, in America, that would be in jeopardy because my pills, even with insurance, would cost about $300 a month. And that is terrifying. I don't like the fact that my lack of money could kill me. It, it just It's insane. Uh, so I am stuck living in Brexit land for the foreseeable future. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's, wow. You know, that, that's, a, yeah, that's a stark and personal illustration of the dilemma that, you know, faces a lot of people in this economy living here, right? Whether it's diabetes medicine or, or what have you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but HIV it's, treatments, it's, yeah. cancer treatments. Right, right. Well, right. and I will tell you that in that, on the, the panel that I did in Boston yeah. uh, about genetic medicine, it, that, you know, once we got to the question and answer part of that, mm-hmm. and, and one of our panelists had written a book called Antidote, which is all about a company called Vertex, which has developed, you know, a gene yeah. therapy um, for muscular dystrophy that costs $300,000 per oh, patient per year. Like the drug cost question around gene therapy medications is going to be uh, unbelievable. And yep. there's so there was so much rage, there was so much anger in that room about drug costs that it was sort of like we had moved way past genetic therapies and gene editing into insulin costs and HIV treatment costs. And, and so like the question of how we're going to address that and who's gonna be able to afford these super transformational radical therapies, mm-hmm. just to bring it back all the way to the mm-hmm. top mm-hmm. is, uh, is going to be a huge part of this conversation moving forward. Nice job closing that loop, Ms. Wood. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, that was good. I like an arc. Yeah. I like an arc. <laughs> you do like an arc. <laughs> time, for, time for the Make Me Smart question where we actually really like to end the show. Uh, what is something you thought you knew that you later found out you were wrong about? Bill Leininger sent us his answer. Something I thought I knew but later found out I was wrong about is thinking that facts change opinions. I've been a doctor since 1991. In the past few years, I've become more involved in women's health care advocacy. In my early efforts, I arrived with a textbook's worth of information to share. However, as I've had more discussions with legislators, policymakers, and other influencers, I've seen how conveying a patient's difficult experience in a well-told story will emotionally resonate with the listener and do more to make my point than an entire slide deck of bar graphs and regression curves. So I'm working on a different kind of communication skill in which I share the significant experiences of one person instead of talking about the statistical significance of a thousand points of data. Hmm. Hmm. I love that. So that's really good, right? Power storytelling and all that, but but also um, America 2019, could I just say. That's it. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Right? You know? (laughs) Seriously. Kind of. No, come on. That's no. No, uh, really. oh, come on. I think that was legit use of, of the dark place thing. I, I think I so. I think so. that was fair. I think that was fair. Uh, anyway, here we go to review. What is something you thought you knew, but then found out you were wrong about? Send us a voice memo. Make me smart at marketplace.org. And maybe I won't get all existential at the end of it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not in charge. I just No, he will. You know my rule about Somebody needs to build this in. Well, my rule about sitting like in front of how many times? Don't, don't think, just talk. That's, that's my rule. 
I know. I'm just curious to know how many times the make me smart answer has sparked the dark place sting. I don't I don't think it's all that many. I think From other God. things elsewhere in the podcast have sparked it. I'm not sure that I'm not, you know. I think there are a lot of answers in the answer to this because I do think storytelling is like ultimately I mean nothing look, nothing is data, it turns out. And I say this as yes. a person who is can be a little spock sometimes. Just, just a little Feelings bit. matter. Just a little bit. Make Me Smart is go. ably produced by Shara Morris. Our senior producer is Eve Tro. Oh, <laughs> They're just back there like, please, please, up, please up, wrap. Please wrap. Tony Wagner is our digital producer. This week's program was engineered by Charlton Thorpe. I know because I heard him. Our theme music was composed by Ben Tolliday and Daniel Ramirez. Thanks to our video producers, Ben Hethcote and Summer Dunsmore. The executive director of On Demand is Star Nieves. Senior vice president, general manager, and non-listener to the end is Deborah Clark. Right. And we are done. Thanks, everybody.